Okay, um, I think we'll get started. Um, I'm glad to see you all here after, uh, I'm sure everybody was up pretty great last night, um, uh, watching the return. Uh, uh, we have a couple of interesting uh, speakers uh, talking about what happened uh, last night, both kind of on the ground at a polling station um, and also from 20,000 feet on the field analysis. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of my impressions and then we'll go to the panel. Um, before we kick off with our video, I just wanted to preview a couple of things coming up. Um, next Wednesday, um, we're going to be looking at the harbor in the affirmative action case and the issue of inequality and race. race. Um, we have two terrific uh, panelists. Uh, Dan Golden, um, who's a force of Prize Living investigative reporter, uh, now is a public uh, but Dan uh, wrote a terrific book called The Price of Admission, and he was the first person to write about um, legacy admissions at Harvard, about Jared Kushner's father paying $2 million um, to help him get into Harvard. Um, he also wrote the first stories about the um, Asian affirmative action case. Um, he's a terrific reporter. Um, he's doing excellent work at ProPublica that we'll talk about as well. Um, and then Margaret Burnham, um, who's a professor at the law school, a former judge, um, here in Massachusetts. Um, she is, uh, is runs a project called the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, um, which um, looks and investigates um, lynching cases. But she is a real moral force and um, talks about um, you know, kind of where we are in race in our society. I mean, the two of them together is going to be a really interesting panel. I really urge all of you to come or to, to be in the halls. Um, We'll then be off for a week to this Thanksgiving, and then on the 28th, um, we're going to be having, hopefully the Mueller report will come out, assuming Trump has inspired everybody else in the Justice Department by then, um, or hasn't already. Um, a really interesting guy, uh, Alexander Zaretsky, I'm sorry, uh, Michal Kuzman, um, who is the uh, number two person at the task media agency uh, in Moscow. And he basically is kind of the Wolf Blitzer or George Stephanopoulos of Russia. Um, he brings on Westerners all the time. Um, he's interviewed uh, Bush, Obama, and so forth. Um, speaks excellent English, um, but he's kind of on a charm offensive um, in the United States, um, trying to talk about Russia what's going on. So we're going to be on a panel. We're going to have uh, David Philippov, who is a former Moscow correspondent of the Washington Post, and he's now here in Northeastern, and Nick Daniloff. Um, who was uh, one of my predecessors at the journalism school, uh, who was actually arrested and imprisoned uh, in the, what was then the Soviet Union back in the 80s. So I think it's going to be a really interesting evening talking about how Russians see America, what's going on with the Mueller investigation, and kind of getting into some foreign policy questions. Um, so, so I definitely put that in your calendar as well. Um, so let's start, as we always do, with a couple of videos, and then we'll start. Yeah. Democrats won the House on Tuesday night, and Republicans added some seats to their Senate majority. Here are some winners and losers. The first winner is Democrats. Yes, Republicans gained seats in the Senate, but Democrats actually took over the chamber of Congress. And at any time we see control of Congress change hands, that's a significant night for the party to come. Thanks to you, tomorrow will be a new day in America. Another one is Nancy Pelosi. She was unseated as Speaker back in 2010 when Republicans won control of the House. She stuck around for years, unlike most speakers. Now she gets a chance to reclaim that gavel as long as Democrats will have her. Next one is Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell is going to have a bigger Senate majority than he had before Election Day, and that's no small thing. More winners are felons in Florida. Amendment 4 in that state reinstated voting rights for most convicted felons. Uh, that actually applies to about 9% of the state's voting age population. Another winner, Democrats' diversity. We have the first openly gay elected governor, Jared Polis from Colorado, the first two Muslim women elected to Congress, the first two Native American women, and we also could see a record number of women elected to Congress. Another winner is John James, the Republican Senate candidate in Michigan. He 
didn't get a lot of national attention or national funding. He still came pretty close to beating Senator Debbie Stabenow. I expect John James will be around for another campaign, and the Republicans will be much more anxious to support him next time. Democratic Senator Sharon Brown scored a pretty early victory on Tuesday night and quickly talked about things as if he's going to be running for president in 2020. Brown has not given many indications about his 2020 plans. I think we saw that for the first time, really, on Tuesday. A big loser on Tuesday night was Democrats' next generation of rising stars. Of course, the big one was Beto O'Rourke losing in Texas to Ted Cruz. We also saw Andrew Gillum lose the Florida governor's race. We saw Stacey Abrams apparently fail to make the runoff in the Georgia governor's race. And Randy Bryce, who earned a lot of attention as the challenger to House Speaker Paul Ryan several months ago, actually lost by double digits in an open seat race that Democrats had a good chance. Another loser is the phrase, it's the economy stupid. We have a historically low unemployment rate. Uh, eight in 10 voters said that the economy was good in the exit polls, and yet we saw the party in power lose control of a chamber of Congress. An election of Kavanaugh, the caravan, law and order, and common sense. Another loser is President Trump's immigration strategy. There was a lot of thought that a more fear-based approach was geared towards turnout in red state Senate races. It may have provided that. It did not, however, seem to do anything to prevent Republicans from losing the House. And the final loser is voting against Brett Kavanaugh. Senators Joe Donnelly and Heidi Heitkamp were the most high-profile votes against him after having voted for Neil Gorsuch, and they did worse than we expected. Meanwhile, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, was the only Democrat to vote for Kavanaugh and he wound up being just fine. Okay, it's, it's never an election night uh, without a little comedy at the end. Here is uh, even better. Before, um, I'll go over there. We're live right now. And, uh, and here we go. <laughs> if you remember what happened on our last live election show, uh, that makes one of us. <laughs> the bad news that night uh, caught me a bit off guard, uh, but tonight I'm prepared. If I have a lovely bottle of uh, bourbon right here, and if for any reason I need to pour myself an emergency drink, I can merely break glass. I can break glass for glass <laughs> right here. Okay. All right, we, uh, we got a few more results. Ted Cruz has held on to his Senate seat in Texas. There we go. But, uh, Save some yeah. to snort later. Okay. <laughs> then again, why wouldn't Ted Cruz win Texas? Because at the end of the day, real cowboys only love three things: barbecue, rodeo, and Canadians who went to Princeton and Harvard. So, <laughs> once again, Ted Cruz defeats Beto O'Rourke. Although, although by not being Ted Cruz, Beto still won. <laughs> Um, so that may be the way a lot of people in the audience saw a lot of people in Massachusetts felt, um, but obviously um, last night was more complicated than that. And I just wanted to run through um, just a couple of uh, a couple of maps uh, and share some thoughts about what happened. And I was uh, kind of calling around to people I know um, who follow politics and and uh, professors here and strategists and trying to get their read on things. So this is kind of a digest of what I was hearing. One in the morning when I went to sleep, and then when I woke up this morning. Um, so, you know, this is from The Guardian, which I think is doing some really great graphics for those of you who are looking for new websites to follow or kind of broadening what you look at. Um, the Guardian does some terrific work. And, and this has a lot of the kind of good news embedded um, in it, which is that, you know, in Iowa, which Trump won by almost 
Um, in 2016, the Democrats flipped two seats. Um, in Texas, even though O'Rourke lost, his coattails uh, were significant, um, and then uh, they won a number of seats there. In Florida, um, even though uh, Gillum uh, lost, um, again, um, there were districts that the uh, Democrats uh, were able to flip. And so I was talking to a, uh, uh, a colleague of mine um, who's a strategist, and he said, you know, if you ask me on election night 2016, if I would be happy with the Democrats taking back the House and flipping several governor mansions, I'd be happy with it. We have members of Congress who want competitive Republican districts. We have some Midwest governors who can start to build their resumes to be front runners in a few cycles. And we demonstrated that deep red states like Texas and Georgia can and should be in play. So that's kind of one take. Um, and this uh, kind of cool map shows um, where the kind of, if not surge or wave, but ripple took place. And what they've done is you can see uh, the blue arrows, the thicker they are, the more the movement towards the Democrats you see. And um, someone called this the to infinity and beyond. Uh, but it, it does capture this sense um, that the Democrats were able to um, reverse some of the bleeding that took place in 2016. Uh, and we're able to, to move uh, in a number of states. Um, the most important, of course, being in the Midwest. Um, that Midwestern wall that Hillary expected was going to guarantee her election in 2016, which Trump won, uh, the Democrats saw significant increases and won governorships um, in Wisconsin and Michigan. I mean, they did very well in Pennsylvania. Um, they lost the governor's race in Ohio, um, but they did well in some of the House races. So, if you're a Democrat looking at this map, even though it wasn't maybe as good as you were expecting, um, it was, it, it did sort of build on something. It, and it reminded me a little bit of 1988, when, you know, after 84, when Reagan's huge landslide, when he crushed uh, Walter Mondale, um, there, there was a feeling that the Democrats were kind of hopeless. And even though Dukakis didn't win in 88, he was able to start reestablishing uh, the Democrats in a number of states and bring them back. Uh, and I think there's an argument that it kind of laid the groundwork for Clinton that, that elections sometimes are incremental. They're not always dramatic shifts one way or the other. And it's possible if you're a Democrat to look at this and say, what do we learn and how do we build on these things uh, moving forward to the presidential year? Um, and so, Demographically, this is something everyone's talking about, um, which is that the biggest increases that the Democrats saw um, were the suburbs. And it does, I think, create this kind of new political map, not so much geographically, but that we seem to be coming, in a way, kind of a more class-based political party. We're starting to look a little bit um, like England or maybe some of the European countries, where people vote not so much on where they live or local issues, but kind of based on their economic interests and their education. Uh, I'm not sure if that's good or bad for the Democrats. Right now, the Democrats see that as, as being something they can build on. Um, uh, uh, but again, one of the problems is, especially in the Senate, um, the working class white voters are concentrated in a number of states that the Republicans have a huge lock on. Um, but these suburban voters, especially women, seem to be moving more and more into the Democratic um, column. And that's going to scramble, I think, on the efforts the Democrats make on who to put ahead in, um, in 2020. Um, so, um, looking at, at sort of the, you know, the bright spots for the Democrats, um, I think the, the Florida um, election was fascinating. They elected two Republicans, um, and yet probably the single most progressive thing on the ballot, um, which was voting rights for felons, um, passed, and it got 60% of the vote which is pretty remarkable. And I think it's worth thinking about why was that? Why, why was that able to pass, even in a state where Republicans control everything? They control the state legislature, every constitutional office, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Senate, uh, and the government. Uh, this is not Massachusetts, and yet um, Florida was willing to enfranchise the felons. It was the only issue I know of when the ACLU and the Koch brothers were on the same side. Um, and, and again, it's just a fascinating development 
and could have a real impact uh, in 2020. Um, I guess there are about 100 women, it looks like, who are going to be going to Congress, um, and that, again, is a dramatic change. As has been written about a lot, the Democrats um, chose women, many of them from the military, had backgrounds, um, either in the military or in military intelligence, and that seemed to be very successful. And at the same time, you had an increase in diversity, um, more Muslim representatives in Congress, no appreciate government in Colorado, uh, Native American. Um, and again, this notion that the Democrats were able to rebuild the wall, or they started to rebuild their wall, not Trump's wall, um, in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And remember, had Trump won, had Trump lost any of these states, um, Hillary Clinton would be president. So this is important when you're looking, when you're looking at that. Um, so those are the reasons for Democrats um, to be optimistic. And I think, you know, early in the day yesterday, early in the evening, they were very optimistic. Um, but as more results came in, um, it became kind of a yes but situation. Um, the Democrats lost Ohio and Florida, um, which is hugely important, both because these are huge states for 2020, but there's a tremendous concern on the Democratic side about gerrymandering and uh, drawing district lines um, after the next census. And obviously, having the governor and control of state legislatures in these two big states um, really matter. And again, I think it poses a, a quandary for Democrats. Why does Sherry Brown do so well in Ohio, but then they can't win the governorship? Um, why do the polls show uh, Gillum winning in Florida, but then he loses? Um, there have always been these hopes in Florida that demographics will change Florida, whether it's an influx of um, Latino immigrants. Puerto Ricans displaced by the hurricane, but somehow Florida continues to um, elude, elude the Democrats. And I think one reason there, which is I think becoming one of the narratives that's emerging from this election, you get wave elections when one group surges and the other group stays home. This was an election where everybody came out. Democrats came out, Republicans came out, young people came out, old people came out, minorities came out, whites came out. And, and they seem to have, in many cases, offset each other, um, especially in Florida, where the turnout of white conservative voters, as in 2016, was also at record levels. Um, as the Washington Post video pointed out, um, all the heroes of the left uh, lost. Um, and as the uh, Republicans were you know, chortling about, uh, despite Oprah, despite all the money that, that, that poured in, the narrative that was developing in the days just before the election talked about Democrats have a huge fundraising advantage, a huge celebrity advantage. They seem to have the wind at their back. And yet, um, in, in all these marquee races, um, the Democrats lost. Um, I will say, by the way, for those of you who are trying to broaden your news um, vision, we talked about this in class. Um, you know, I typically watch CNN, um, but I watched Fox a lot yesterday. And I was actually impressed with Fox. Um, I'm not sure if it was in part a reaction to the Sean Hannity uh, coming out for Trump, but I thought Fox did a really interesting job. They were very good. They actually called the House for the Democrats first. Um, they had Carl Rove on, which whatever you think of his politics, he's one of the smartest political analysts out there. They had Laura Ingram, who again, whatever you think of her politics, is very smart and sharp. They had Juan Williams, who was pushing back um, on Laura Ingram a lot. Um, just kind of had Chris Wallace, who's a great journalist. Um, I thought Fox actually did a very good job, and it was interesting seeing from a conservative network how they analyze things. Um, and I think there was a lot, there was a lot to be learned there. So that's another argument for widening our perspective. Because sometimes you hear things from from sources you know, that might um, that might surprise you. Um, so this was a um, this was actually a professor who advised Bernie Sanders. Uh, back in 2016, but he was very critical of Hillary Clinton and came out of this election um, feeling uh, pretty discouraged. And uh, his comment to me was, the president's party typically loses about 30 House seats. Historically, that's true. Plus, they actually lost a few seats in the Senate. All this bodes ill since it reveals how broad and deep Trump's support really is. And I think that was one of my takeaways um, from last night, which is that I think there was a feeling, starting with the Women's March, you know, living in Massachusetts, that this was kind of a spasm. 2016 was this kind of
kind of moment where the country either was contained or was manipulated by the Russians or kind of choose your conspiracy theory and that it couldn't last and the country would rise up and repudiate Trump. Uh, in fact, that didn't happen. Um, I think it's true, as the Post says, anytime uh, a House of Congress flips, that's big news. But um, I think it's more complex and, and clearly Trump um, is onto something. He's not just a demagogue. He's not just somebody um, who's, being, you know, who's waiting for no reason. And in fact, it's important to realize that uh, the decision to go with immigration, anti-immigration strategy, to go out there, um, to push capital, all these things really came from Trump's gut. And he does seem to have kind of his finger on the pulse of something that's affecting, you know, a, a, a significant uh, amount of voters. This is kind of interesting. Uh, Trump's approval rating in the national exit poll remains at 44%, which is, which is very low. And yet, if you look at all these states, he's actually more popular than we think. Georgia, Ohio, and some of the Florida, Wisconsin, Nevada. And in every one of these states, um, except for Nevada, um, the Democrats either lost governor's races or Senate races, or it was very narrow. I think Arizona is still in dispute. Wisconsin, I think the Democrats have no doubt uh, a victory. But again, what this says to me is this kind of belief that you know, it's just a matter of the country waking up to what a bad President Trump is or how bad he is, is not true. Um, that there's a lot of support for him. The fact that it's withstood the past two years suggests that he's going to go into 2020 um, in, a, in a pretty strong position. So some questions that I ended up with, which we can discuss or maybe provoke some conversation. Uh, where does the resistance go from here? Uh, where does Elizabeth Warren go from here? Um, the liberals accept that Trump is onto something, that 2016 wasn't a fluke, uh, or where and how did they keep on mobilizing? Um, I think the impact of the Mueller investigation is going to be very interesting. Obviously, as we were all like coming here, Trump fired Jeff Session, appointed a loyalist in its place. Um, there was an interesting exit poll that suggests that by a narrow amount, I think 47 to 44, um, Americans disapprove now. Um, and so, again, Trump may uh, find ways to spin that, that it will not be as damaging as, as some people think it's going to be. Um, and, and I was reminded of the fact that even though Nixon resigned, um, it's important to remember that the political change that he started in 68, a Southern strategy, Republicans embracing uh, whites in the South, the white working class, law and order, uh, kind of a, a more robust, Republican Party that was moving more to the right um, ended up winning in the long term. Uh, Carter won in, in 1976, in part because of Nixon's resignation, but then Reagan and Bush followed them. So again, it raises this question of, you know, separate from Trump, within the electorate as a whole, and that's why these governor's races are interesting, are the Republicans more in tune or have they unleashed um, forces? or recognize forces that were more maybe a central white -right country um, than, we, than we thought they were. Obama was out there and kind of his line was, well, whatever you have change, it's two steps forward, one step back. And so maybe that's what we're seeing. Um, but again, I, I think it's a, it's a more complex view than, you know, Trump was a mistake and, and that Democrats are gonna try to correct it. Um, the other question that's really interesting to me is how does Trump as a politician? You know, we've asked over and over again here, is Trump crazy or is he crazy like a fox? Um, and, um, and again, I, I, I think he's shown himself to be very deaf um, as a politician for this cycle. Uh, I wouldn't put it past him to then suddenly lurch to the center. A lot of people said that if Trump had not talked at all and just went on the economy, maybe the Democrats wouldn't have done as well uh, in, in the House races uh, as they did. Um, I call it a Pelosi trap. Um, one of the points that was being made on TV that I thought was interesting was that one of the opportunities for Trump is that people are used to Democrats and Republicans fighting. So if Trump starts attacking Pelosi and the Democrats, people are used to that. And, um, and that may kind of reinforce the divisions that are out there and not alienate um, those suburban Republican voters who are turned off by from, you know, cats on women and on the press um, and on immigrants. 
Um, they may just see this now as kind of Republicans and Democrats fighting, discounted, and focused on issues like the economy, which may help Trump um, in 2020. Um, as the post video suggested, uh, Mitch McConnell, again, somebody who has shown his political brilliance in the way he handled um, court nominations. Um, it turns out, there's a very good article on Politico that I recommend for those of you who really want to get in the weeds. McConnell, behind the scenes, made a lot of the choices of which Senate races to focus on. And um, in an interesting way, the way I think Republicans can sometimes be, he was quite brutal in not challenging lots of races, accepting that there were certain races that, that Republicans could not win, and pouring resources into the Donald race, um, into the Heidi High Camp race, um, into the Claire McCaskill race, um, which ended up really paying off. So again, I think McConnell, in a way, is, is sort of an undercover um, political, um, I'm not sure genius is the word, but certainly um, a very effective. Um, so finally, looking at divided government, I thought these were two interesting examples. If we look at it historically, what can we expect? And obviously every election is different, every president is different. But here you have two cases that are at least have elements of being comparable to what uh, Trump and the Democrats face today. Uh, Harry Truman became president, and in 1946 was so unpopular that he lost Congress um, and was considered a dead duck running in 1948. And of course, as we now know, he came storming back, one of the great comebacks in political history, um, and he did it by running against the do-nothing Congress. So again, if you're Donald Trump, you may look at that and say, that's a possible strategy for 2020. You have a Congress or a House that's investigating you, that criticizes you, um, but um, there's a, there, there are opportunities to run against that and get reelected. Another thing that happened um, between 46 and 48, we always have to be ready for unexpected surprises. That was actually a time, paradoxically, when the great foreign policy consensus was formed between Republicans and Democrats. Um, remember, it was the start of the Cold War. Um, Russia is kind of gaining in power. Um, the communists are moving to China and take over the country in 49. And actually, that period that was so also became a time where Truman was able to reach out and build coalitions with Republicans on foreign policy. They were still trying to be in the election, but they were able to forge a consensus on foreign policy. We don't know what's going to happen if there's going to be a foreign policy crisis or a terrorism strike or something like that. That's something we haven't had. But again, it's kind of interesting how history can surprise On the other example, which is more recent, is the new Cambridge election in 19. When um, Clinton, much like Obama, brings the Democrats back, comes in as a progressive, you know, tries to pass all sorts of legislation, and then there's a backlash against him, much more severe uh, than the backlash against Trump in this election, and he ends up having a battle in Republican Congress um, starting in 1993. And despite New Cambridge's best efforts and investigations and kind of all these gates that we were following back then, uh, he goes on to win uh, in uh, 1996, and then, of course, um, survives that impeachment afterwards. So again, you know, good politicians are able to overcome things, and one of the, the things that I would think Trump may be looking at is how the Republicans overreach in 94. That Newt Gingrich, uh, shutting down the government and doing other things, basically played into Clinton's hands uh, and was able to create a narrative the Republicans were not able to build on their gains. And I think that's a danger the Democrats are probably aware of. Uh, the one caveat to that was this was raised, I think, on one of the TV shows last night. And somebody who covered Clinton said that Clinton was really good at compartmentalizing things. So he could fight with Gingrich, he could be upset about investigations, he could be upset about impeachment, but then he could kind of shut that down and focus on delivering his political message. Trump hasn't shown that yet. He seems to be mad kind of all the time at everything. Um, and so that'll be, I think, a question whether um, Trump can discipline himself um, to find ways to, uh, to, push, uh, to push his agenda, even while the Democrats uh, try to thwart it. Um, so that's uh, my two cents. Um, now to hear from some other folks, I want to welcome up our panel. Um, Joanna Rice, 
is a, a former columnist for the Boston Globe. Uh, she's written for Politico. Uh, she writes for WGBH, WBC. Uh, she's now at Northeastern, actually running um, a magazine called Experience. She's going to talk about DC before we get into politics. Um, we also have Lewis Robles coming up. Um, Lewis was in East Boston uh, yesterday um, working as a poll worker, but working with um, Hispanic, Latino um, voters. And um, he was uh, objective and down the down the center, he couldn't lobby for one side or the other, but has some interesting insights about who was showing up. I mean, I think everyone wonders what's going to happen demographically with the rise of, of Latinos and what does that mean? We're going to share some thoughts kind of from on the ground. Um, Ted Lansmark um, is here again at the Caucus Center. Um, and um, why don't we start um, with Joanne, if you just want to talk a little bit about your new gig. Up. On? Yes. yes. Thank you for having me. Thanks for letting me give my little um, spiel. Yes, I was at the um, I was at the Boston Globe for about 16 years, and before that, at the Times Picayune in New Orleans, I covered a lot of politics there. Um, but now I am at Northeastern, and uh, in this past year, about five or six months ago, we launched a new magazine. It's sort of housed in the Department of um, External Affairs over at Columbus Place. Um, but it's not about Northeastern, it's really more about the ideas that motivate and drive Northeastern. So it's about the power of experience to open people's minds, to change their lives, to transform culture. So we're telling stories about that and trying to share them with the world. I've brought my materials down there, some little postcards, and also a sign up for our newsletter because our URL is very easy to remember, expmag.com. But if you just sign up for our newsletter, you don't even have to remember it. You can get our stories uh, right in your inbox. Um, I, one of the, what we're trying to do, in addition to sort of general interest stories, some civically minded stuff, and there's one thing I'd love to point you toward, which is a big interactive project that we worked on with Dan Zedek from the journalism department, and it's about immigration. And we really, you know, we figured immigration was going to be a big uh, policy issue heading into the midterm elections. So we created an interactive that's kind of like, um, some of you might remember the Choose Your Own Adventure stories that were very analog in my youth, uh, where you could you know, kind of follow a character through a path. And we created eight different immigrants over time, um, starting with uh, an Irish immigrant from the 1800s, and a Chinese immigrant from the late 1800s, going up through a DACA recipient today. And you can kind of follow their lives. It's all based on historic facts and laws, the way the laws have changed. And it's a really interesting way to kind of see the commonalities and, and, uh, and similarities between these immigration experiences. So check it out. Thank you. No, I really recommend it. It's really, it's, it's a fun read. It's very well designed. You can dip into it um, because it's online. It's really so talking about politics, you in Politico were one of the first people um, to talk about Anna Presley and kind of see what was going to happen there, which surprised everybody. Um, so what was your takeaway after about the three hours last night about what, the, what we saw? You know, I, it's funny. I had lunch today with a, a sort of committed Democrat, um, someone who's run for office, and she was feeling very positive about how the Democrats did, and I felt more like you did. I, you know, I felt watching it last night and kind of blinking. Uh, and, and I was mostly watching CNN, which was kind of crazy last night. It was like we're running across the set. It was sort of bananas. <laughs> Um, it was exhausting just watching the anchors trying to keep up with their own graphics. But my um, my my feeling was that there had been this 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 idea, like you said, that it was going to be a massive repudiation of Trump, and that didn't happen. And I think uh, you know we saw some of the weaknesses of polling in a place like Florida. You know, I think I think there really is a problem and a phenomenon with polling where people don't always report honestly what they're thinking what they're doing, and I think in certain key states we saw that. Um, I think we saw, as you said, the depths of Donald Trump's support. I think in 2016 there was this tendency to, to, to compartmentalize these rallies, to watch these Trump rallies if you were, you know, and, and see them as this weird phenomenon, but that didn't actually apply to broad, broad thinking among voters. And in fact, if you can draw 25,000 people cheering and screaming to your rally, that probably says you have support outside the boundaries of that hurdle and that arena. So I think um, I, I think we did get a sense of how challenging it is going to be for Democrats to push back against Trump. And I think I think Nancy Pelosi is thinking about that right now. And it was interesting to watch her today 
start to outline some of her strategy. That, you know, I think she's going to face a lot of pressure from new progressives who have been elected into the Democratic caucus who are going to want to investigate everything and really kind of turn the House into a way to attack Trump on every level and bring up his tax return and, and you know, piggyback on the Mueller investigation. I think she's going to try to put the brakes on that, and I think that's wise. I think if the Democrats are going to be successful, they need to focus on policy and they need to sort of present themselves as doers and people who can actually find solutions to problems. Um, Lewis, what was your sense? You know, I mean, you were objective, but just now that you reflect back on it, what did you see in your race, Boston? Um, what did you see, and, and kind of did you take any lessons from it or anything? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm from East Boston. I was born up there. And, you know, East Boston used to be primarily the Italian immigrants in my neighborhood. Obviously, over the years, it's changed more into the Latin American. Um, now, I was a uh, full inspector in Orion Heights. Uh, this part of East Boston uh, still holds on to a strong uh, Italian uh, generational uh, roots. Uh, nonetheless, there were still some headquarters in that area that I was stationed at. And uh, for, most of, for most of the day, I noticed that um, as well as there was way greater turnout than other years. I uh, was in the mayoral election, uh, primaries, and yesterday was just like a lot of people consistently came, uh, usually throughout the day, you know, by midday. Uh, Freedoms or, or Italians or what? Uh, everybody actually. Uh, like it was like, you know, it, it, you know, I, I, you know, I can't keep specific stats, but my overall presumption it was, it was nice. Um, and so this, I mean, yesterday, uh, definitely was a huge surge. And I was also serving as a Spanish interpreter. Uh, so I was able to help voters who had questions on the ballots. Uh, from observing that, a lot of them, um, in my opinion, I think weren't as well informed, uh, especially with ballot questions. Uh, even though they are translated uh, on the ballot specifically, a lot of them still ask me questions about it. Uh, and as a full inspector, I had to explain it to them in a non-partisan way in order that the explanation wouldn't mean them into a yes or no, uh, regardless of the question. And so a lot of them Obviously, um, you know, speaking Spanish to them, they, you know, it was kind of had like a bond. Uh, they rely on you more, so they put in trust in you, and you know, they would say, oh, "Yeah, it's a good thing, right?" Um, but you know, from my perspective, I can't say yes. I mean, I, I can't tell you how to vote, and so that was uh, one of the uh, big uh, takeaways that I had was that uh, in terms of Hispanic words, I just more way of getting them information about candidates and questions and how to vote specifically. And why were the Hispanic voters there? What would you say? What made them turn out? Uh, well, for one, uh, a lot of them um, were came for a specific election. So, you know, a lot of them wanted to support Elizabeth Warren. Uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, Presley, uh, they wanted to vote specifically for them. And then they would ask me about what about the other elections, and you know, they just didn't know enough info. Uh, you know, those who came out for you know Presley, they're like, where is she? You know, saying hello to them, and then they would ask, where the rest of these people, and what are they running for? Um, you know, a lot of them didn't know that the governor was up for the election, and so it was definitely a huge drive for a specific um, candidate or question, and then. Well, you know, the ballot this year was actually two pages, so a lot of them just didn't um, know about the rest, or just, you know, they didn't have enough info, uh, in my opinion, to uh, make a decision, strong decision. But were they even aware that uh, uh, one of the gubernatorial <laughs> candidates has uh, this kind of proof? Uh, well, you, that was actually interesting because, um, you know, there was actually, uh, there were a couple of other candidates that did have a uh, Spanish speaking surname. And, uh, you know, when they didn't know about the specific candidate, uh, they would just go based off the name. Um, you know, I think uh, the Secretary of State, Bill Galvin, obviously, uh, won, but I 
think it was a really great great party. Uh, and it was a Spanish name, and I saw a couple of them just mark it off. You know, they didn't know the secretary just like did, and the chief election officer. And so, uh, just things of, you know, they did this off, and they didn't know exactly who the candidate was and what he stood for. Uh, Ted, what was your what was your feeling at the end of the night? Um, I, I did not expect a uh, a great wave. In fact, the outcomes uh, very closely parallel um, my expectations. I think that if um, we had thought uh, two or three or four years ago um, that uh, African American candidates could run in the deep south of Georgia and Florida, um, and get even a third of the vote. We would have thought that would have been a great accomplishment. Um, and the fact that uh, in, in both cases, uh, the numbers came in significantly higher than that, um, it really means that, in fact, there is uh, progress being made in, in a number of places. And I would actually ask that you pull up um, the uh, uh, image that you had of uh, where the blue wave or blue trickle or, or what have you might, um, in fact, be emerging. Because one of the things that strikes me is uh, a person who spent uh, recently a couple of years down in South Carolina um, is the fact that in uh, a red state like South Carolina, uh, the, the coastal uh, congressional district that runs from uh, just north of Charleston down to Buford, which is a military town, um, actually elected a Democrat. Um, and that's the same state that not that long ago had an Indian woman as governor um, and uh, now has one of the two African American senators uh, who is uh, in Congress. And we like to um, in, in this part of the world, be dismissive uh, of politics in the South as being um, all red state um, and not at all progressive. Um, and yet, in those states, we're finding on the ground level uh, that there are at least as many people of color and women who are being elected um, as they are here in New England. Um, and, and the kind of uh, elitist view that we have um, here, um, I, I think, uh, shields us uh, from recognizing um, how change is, in fact, taking place around the country in places we don't always anticipate. Um, and I think we have a, a very strong tendency to view politics at this level uh, rather than at the ground level, which is why I um, wanted to use the here. <laughs> Uh, tonight, because in fact, the red wave that brought about Donald Trump did not start with Donald Trump. It started at least a decade before that in ground level elections that uh, ended up influencing the shape of congressional districts that then in turn uh, produced uh, safe seats for conservative candidates. And it seems to me that uh, what we saw last night um, is part of a reversal of that, the recognition that as much as we might want our heroes, and those of us who think of ourselves as progressive, um, like Vito or uh, the, the potential governor of, uh, of Georgia, as much as we want our heroes to lead a blue wave, uh, or to have led a blue wave last night. That's not how political change happens. In fact, it happens at the ground level in uh, district by district um, circumstances, and that the change in the governor's races, which will have a major impact on redistricting state by state when the 2020 census takes place, may in fact be a much more significant outcome to look at from last night uh, than um, what uh, many of us looked at as, as a potential big uh, blue tsunami. Uh, 
I, I would add to that state legislature races. I mean, those are that that's the you're right, the state house is where after the next census the redistricting is gonna happen. And I think you're right, the, the effects of the district drawing after the last census had a you know had a real effect on on this race and the one before it and and on the, the makeup of, of Congress. Well, so, Jordan, let me ask you though, when you, when you covered the Presley race, that was sort of the high watermark of you know the progressive way of thinking. We're on to something, we think it was blue wave, and we have to embrace it, and that optimism spilled over into that Stacey. If you were sitting with Democratic strategists now, what are they debating, and are they going to move left, stay in the center? How do they navigate this now that someone has? Yeah, it's tricky because that race was another example of politics being local. I mean, you know, everyone wanted to jump on this idea that Ayanna Presley was the same thing as Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. She is not. She's very much a creature of the political establishment. She has progressive values, but she's not a, you know, she, she, she's not as much of an upstart. I think she's much more of an establishment player. And I think that's going to be the big question in the same way that, you know, that, that Paul Ryan and John Boehner before then had to struggle with, you know, within their own, as they led their own chambers, this kind of question of do we go moderate, how much voice do the moderates have versus how much voice do the you know, people on the extremes have, that's going to be what the Democrat, the, 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 the Democratic Party is struggling with, right? Um, you know, again, and again, it's going to be, there are people who were elected who ran on a platform in some of these super blue states of, you know, abolish ICE. Let's you know let's let's impeach Trump and I mean you know for in those local districts and some of those very safe blue districts that was a very popular thing to say and I think deeply felt by these candidates when you get to Congress and you're trying to to put forth the kind of a winning national policy strategy how much how much do movements like that kind of get in your own way and what is I mean the Democrats have to be thinking now about 2020 you know they need to be thinking about what's the kind of overarching message that they want to send as they look forward and they try to, to beat Trump in, in the presidential race. And I think obstructionism is very, very appealing. Uh, fighting Trump, that idea of resistance has a big emotional appeal. I think there's such, a, you know, among the Democrats and the, and the progressives especially, there's such a feeling of emotion associated. He, you know, the, the red meat that Trump throws out of Republicans is is emotionally painful to Democrats, and it drives this this you know real passion for fighting him. How that plays to the moderates in the rest of the country and the people who are you know turned off by political fighting, but are going to come out for a presidential race, and maybe they only come out every four years, not every two years. You've really got to think about what that message is saying to um, me. Louis, let me ask you again, taking off your objective uh, poll watcher hat. Um, what's your, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about uh, a Latino surge, you know, his fan has come out, um, Trump's rhetoric with that kind of motivate people. I mean, just even anecdotally, what's your sense? Friends or family or people you saw at the polls? Was it, are they animated by a dislike of Trump? Is it more based on issues? Do you characterize that at all? Yeah, uh, so, you know, Trump wasn't, you know, elected two years ago. So uh, last election, for example, uh, there was a, even with the Hispanic voters that, that were there, um, they would, you know, they're very friendly. So, you know, they would tell me comments, you know, we have to vote now, or uh, even yesterday, um, for the uh, kind of candidates, you know, we, they need our support, and so yeah, definitely um, with the uh, President Trump. Uh, at least you know from what I've observed, that uh, they are definitely committed to voting uh, to combat that. And another thing I'd like to add is that uh, so at least in Massachusetts, uh, you know, we go into polling station. The first thing they're going to ask you is your address. Now your ID is not required unless you're an inactive voter or. I even put your social security number for registry. Um, yesterday, especially a lot of these hand voters literally had their ID ready. Uh, some of them came with passports, and it wasn't required. Uh, I mean, if they had it ready, it, it definitely helped me because I just saw the address and name. 
but it was not a requirement. But they were, you know, had the adoption spreading, even though in Massachusetts it's not required. So you can tell that they definitely uh, are committed to uh, voting and making sure that people suffer, especially in this um, era. I like that. They were kind of ready. Yeah, oh, yeah definitely. Um, also, I'd like to mention, uh, I was also a poll inspector in the early election um, phase. Uh, so I, in East Boston, uh, there was a weekend um, where the whole day, anybody from any part of the city could come vote. And um, this only happens during federal elections. And when you check in, it's actually a bit of a different process. They actually have these things called um, full pants, they're normal iPads, but what they do is that they go into the uh, voter registration data, uh, database and they pull up and said, by address, it's your name. And uh, one of the quickest ways to get through that is, I mean, you just have to type in your name, but if you have your license, it literally takes two seconds. It just takes a picture of the um, barcode behind your license or ID, and then it quickly pulls out your info. And so uh, for the early election cycle, um, it was uh, made it a lot quicker. And of course, that's, um, that was that also a lot of Senate voters uh, were ready <laughs> just in case any instructions came up. Um, Jordan, let me ask you, so it's never too early to talk about 2020. Um, so how do you handicap the field? Who's going to run? Is Elizabeth Warren already you know, in with both feet? And kind of Cuomo's out there. What what is 2020 starting to look like for them? Yeah, I, I will preface this by saying that after being spectacularly wrong about 2016, I hesitate to <laughs> take anything I say with a grain of salt. I will advise you. Um, you know, I, I do think um, there's. I, I've never personally thought that Elizabeth Warren was right to run for president. And I think that there were, for many years, she felt the same way, that she serves a very useful purpose uh, in, in the Senate right now. She is that gadfly. She's a very, she's, she's able to be a, a very specific and strong voice of opposition. And she loses some of that power and ability the instant she enters the arena and runs for, for president. It's, just, it's, it's a whole different ball game. She also all of a sudden has to answer to a whole different set of issues. She has vulnerabilities. We know some of vulnerabilities because Trump's attacked her for some of them. But you know, the, the, there's a whole new set of vulnerabilities that are laid bare. She loses some of her power and effectiveness. So I see her looking very seriously like she's going to run, and I'm a little bit surprised, and I think sometimes the voices that you hear around you get into your head as a politician. Um, so uh, if I were to predict, I would say it wouldn't really go well for her. This is her kind of uh, you know, position in the campaign, but that doesn't mean that she won't run. Um, you know, I, I've heard, you know, you, you hear a lot of speculation about some of those rising stars, you hear better O'Rourke, you know, his name already, you know, he, was, he didn't win, but still his name is already being thrown around as potential presidential fodder. You hear Kamala Harris, who really, uh, you know, positioned herself during the Kavanaugh hearings as, a, you know, a, a, a very compelling voice. Um, you know, you, 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 we see, we saw, you know, some other folks auditioning during those hearings. Cory Booker is, you know, someone who, you know, clearly has been kind of eyeing that path. And, and tried on a sort of angry progressive voice during those hearings. And, you know, I mean, a lot of the folks who have been auditioning for that, that Democratic primary have really tried to put on that really old progressive voice. And, you know, that, that's clearly a reaction to what happened to Hillary Clinton, the sense that modern, you know, the, the, the board is forging that that Clintonian triangulation path might not be the right approach. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to see everyone kind of putting on that coat. Do you think that people now are going to look at other coats, the white Midwestern governor coat or the, the white Midwestern senator coat? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see in this field who kind of, who, who takes that on and who, who tries to be the establishment. I mean, we haven't heard necessarily even the last of Hillary Clinton yet. She's still kind of, you know, putting out these little sort of test test statements. I wouldn't mind being president. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't 100% rule her out. Um, Ted, you were kind of optimistic talking about the change, it's gradual and so forth. Are you optimistic about 2020 for the Democrats, or do you think it's a longer, a longer bill? <laughs> Um, before our class tonight, uh, or, or this afternoon, um, I was prepared to uh, focus any comments we had um, on uh, the election results, and then the news came out around sessions, uh, which uh, throws another uh, wrinkle into the dynamic. Um, there's a lot that's going to happen. Uh, I think particularly in the next six months, it's going to shape uh, what happens in, in 2020. And I frankly think 2020 right now is going to be uh, a wide open race uh, with uh, some candidates we might not um, have thought about up to now. Um, I, I think uh, that the uh, former governor of South Carolina, as an Indian woman, is going to um, shake some people up. I mean, she won in South Carolina um, in a place where one would not have anticipated that she would have been elected. Um, I think there'll be some very uh, unexpected names that might appear, like Bill Gates. Um, people who have said, no, I, I would never do that, but if they uh, announced, there'd be a lot of people who would say, ooh, that would be interesting. Um, I think Bloomberg is uh, not uh, out of the running at this point. Um, I think someone with a military background is going to have a very uh, strong uh, opportunity to run. Um, so frankly, as far as 2020 is concerned, uh, I, I think that uh, it could be a good, very good year for uh, progressives, assuming uh, that we stop talking about left and right and start to talk about the specific issues uh, that will mobilize not only uh, suburban women, uh, but uh, working class people of all colors who feel disenfranchised uh, despite the low uh, employment. And then a the person, I don't know the name, I think you are going to see testing the waters is Kevon Patrick from Massachusetts. There's been a lot of uh, whispering. Uh, about him, and you know, he cuts an interesting figure. He was sort of talking the Obama talk in his campaign in Massachusetts before Obama did it. It was, uh, you know, but, but I think he was, yes, we can, we can perform together, we can. But, you know, they, they have remarkably similar profiles. He has a very compelling personal story. Um, he's, a, he's, he's a Massachusetts guy, so you know, we, we know what happens to Massachusetts candidates on that national stage. They get to a certain point and then they somehow can't push it through. But it'll be interesting to see how he he is taken, in, you know, in, in comparison to Barack Obama. Yeah, well, let me ask that. This is my last question before we open up to the audience. Um, so the uh, so Baker wins, uh, going away. Um, the nurses um, question of, of the cap on nurses loses pretty significantly. Transgender rights passes. Are we not as progressive as we think, or is it a more complicated progressivism? What, what do you take from the, the local? I mean, the first thing to, that everyone needs to know about Massachusetts that people don't understand from outside is that the majority of Massachusetts residents are unenrolled. You know, I mean, there there is a pride in independence. There's a long-standing tradition of you know splitting splitting the the vote and voting a Republican governor and a, a broadly, largely Democratic <laughs> legislature. So none of that is new. Charlie Baker is the classic. Bill Wells style Massachusetts Republican and going back beyond Bill Wells, I mean, you know, there, there's a there's a kind of a fiscally conservative, socially liberal kind of Republican. It's like the Democrats' favorite Republican, and those are the people who consistently win elections. That's what Mitt Romney ran as. Now he's a Utah senator who has a whole different set of values. But when he was running for governor in Massachusetts, that's who he was too. Um, you know, until he realized he wanted to run for president, and he started pivoting kind of midstream. So, um, you know, I'm not surprised at all that Massachusetts Democrats liked Charlie Baker. Um, he's towed the line fairly successfully and in, in, in sort of denouncing Trump whenever he can. It was a little tricky for him, you know, knowing he needed to mobilize still the Republican base during the, the gubernatorial race this time. So we kind of loved the, the Jeff Neal thing a little bit, but I think voters were 
quite willing to forgive him for it because he's that kind of technocratic, socially liberal guy. Can I just add to this? Um, so apart from being a bull inspector, um, I actually uh, campaigned for Charlie Baker. Uh, you know, I remember he's Boston and uh, at least in politics. Uh, I, uh, people have asked me uh, to reach out to voters. So, for example, uh, last year in the uh, city council, uh, Stephen Pesan Philly, uh, who was a uh, candidate for council in Boston, um, asked him about his campaign. And uh, so I have gone to the word on uh, and a lot of, you know, it's in Massachusetts, obviously, uh, the Republican part. Uh, some people will be, you know, like, oh, you're Republican. Others, uh, especially when I was on the Bayer campaign, they were, uh, a lot of people were very moderate. Um, they had me knocking on some uh, people that were trying to be registered Democrats. And, you know, they would tell me, like, you know, I do like Baker. He's a uh, designer, normal Republican. He is a compromised guy. And so, uh, going on, being on the ground again, uh, I did notice that. Also, um, as a poll inspector, uh, the uh, registrations, you actually see uh, the people's affiliation of, um, you know, whether it has to be or or you were born and bold. And uh, to your point, uh, there's actually a lot of people that do not enroll in any party. Uh, in the primaries, um, you know, if you're unenrolled, you can choose between three ballots. And a lot of people were actually you know, debating. You know, they asked to see both, they want to make a choice, but like they never strictly said, I mean, I mean there are people that strictly you know, agree to a party, but there was also a huge amount of people that which party has better candidates or in solid side with one party. Okay, we'll now start the Olympic part of our program. Don, running up and down the steps. If you have a question, just raise your hand and grab Don. Hi. Um, last week we talked about looking at the media and how they covered their candidates. And I asked about coverage of um, women and um, minorities. So I did a little bit, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but it supports very much what Dr. Um, Professor Landsberg was saying about the prevalence of the minority candidates in state races. And as an example, in Alaska, there are numerous Native American women. Numerous, and then we have one here. So that's really, really exciting. There were several who have um, in national races in different states, in Arizona and in Kansas. And I looked at how they were covered. Deb Halen, who is a, a Laguna Pueblo member in Arizona, and Grace Davis, uh, Ho Chuck, who was a Ho Chuck people in Kansas. And they were both covered locally. They didn't really get a national, any national coverage. And then I looked at some people right on our doorstep, Eddie Edwards, a Republican, running in the New Hampshire First Congressional District, first African American man, New Hampshire. His opponent was Chris Pappas, first openly gay man. So that was a race where either one would move the needle. And I think, as you know, um, Mr. Pappas did win. Um, I followed Sophia Wazir in uh, New Hampshire for a state race. She would be the first Afghani woman, Muslim, immigrant, refugee person in the state house. She did win. And she was also pregnant all summer while she was campaigning. So she got, and this is, I think, where I'm going to end, it's one of the most, or post where I'm going to end. Most important things about her was that she got local coverage. She got good coverage in the primaries, but then she didn't get much. But where she got really good coverage and is the, to the letters to the editor of the Concord Mind. I So I did searches for her and I found just over and over and over again. And they were not about her background. 
they were about Sophia, Sophia was your, is a candidate who's right for us. She's interested in our community. She is rooted here, and so it's very, very interesting to watch. But I know in this class, we've talked a lot about the loss of the local papers and the role they play. We talk a lot about the reporting, but we don't really talk that much about how the public interacts with them. Um, Do you have a sense of how that's playing out? Oh. Um. Um, I mean, so I think you're, you're raising the context of the media, which I think is interesting, and maybe we can broaden it out. I mean, so the media was roundly criticized in 2016. You know, we just everything, we screwed it up, all that kind of thing. Did the media do better? And on this question of things that may be kind of underneath the surface, is the media doing a better job at at least preparing readers for surprises or things that may go against kind of a, a bigger narrative? Um, did the media do it? I mean, I think the media does cover local races. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that this is the forum and this is this, this is this is the opportunity for you know and and um, the fewer local outlets there are, like the more I guess I would say the more granular the local outlet is, the more likely a local candidate is going to get coverage. And to your earlier point, Ed, that's that's, that's not only the pipeline for higher office, it's where a lot of the key decisions get made. State legislatures are vitally important as laboratories for democracy and for policy. This is where Obamacare started and as you know, places where these congressional districts are drawn. So to, to lose that opportunity for local coverage, and even, you know, even a paper like The Globe, where I worked for many years, even the, the globe is kind of too big and too regional to get on a granular level and really get to vote really comprehensive coverage to every state legislature <laughs> race. The globe will sort of cherry pick a few that seem interesting and everything else gets kind of reduced to briefs. And what we really need are the smaller local papers. Um, and it's, so, so it'll, they're, they're vitally important. I still, this is a separate issue, but I think the media has a huge problem with how to cover Trump. This is kind of like we could spend three or four hours at least discussing this, you know, on its own. I mean, it, I think I think there's this um, chase the shiny object impulse in covering Trump, and I think if the media has has done, learned anything in the last two years, it's that we need to recalibrate the way we cover his every tweet his every utterance, his performances at these press conferences, everything that he does is kind of performative, and figure out a way to separate what's real from what's performance, and figure out a way to signal what's important and what is. Can I just add to that? Um, I myself, I say, from all the elections. And to your point, uh, state legislatures, uh, for example, I do my can, my uh, house or the polls, but also we're in Massachusetts, but I didn't know anything about other races until this morning. Uh, finally, it's, you know, how much many seats were Democrats, and, yeah, it's again. but you know, uh, last night there was a huge uh, talk about, you know, governors, but they also mentioned state legislators, for example. I mean, we know that Charlie Baker revoked in one year, but never really they mentioned that we also have a Democratic majority the legislature, and so you know, if you're like some kind of the state of you know, governors, might as well legislature. You know, this funny election of the governor can't tell you the whole story of what's going on in the state, um, you know, locally or nationally. Yeah, I think there's an interesting paradox, and you, you picked up a little bit on when you were talking about kind of local media and letters to the editor and things like that. At the same time, there's this nationalization going on. Everyone's on the internet. I'm struck when you talk about door knocking, you know. And, and at the beginning of uh, the class uh, back in September, we had uh, a student here who worked on the Anna Presley race. And it's kind of an interesting thing. You have kind of old school, new school, right? That, that, um, there's a tremendous amount of energy, I think, especially among young people, to do that traditional door knocking, phone banking, and then trying to figure out how you turn that to become effective in the social media world. Um, I think it'll be interesting as they analyze what happened yesterday, you know, why were the polls wrong 
were the Republicans effective in somehow getting their vote out? We always focus on how the Democrats need to do that, but the Republicans did too. And I wonder if there are new techniques coming up to try to build on on this traditional door knocking kind of poster thing that's been around forever. And one interesting thing about door knocking, one of the reasons I think door knocking is so effective, and you're right, Ayanna Presley used it to great effect as part of the reason she was able to win this primary, is door knocking is a sign of authenticity. It really is this, you know, it, it's it's personal, it's either the candidate right there at the door before you, or it's person to person, someone who, you know, who, who is committed enough to volunteer their time. I mean, it, it really brings it down to this authentic personal level. One of the interesting things that we saw in the last couple of weeks in the nationally was this storyline in Georgia where you had these celebrity door knockers. Oprah came down to knock on doors with all the cameras around her. Or Stacey Abrams, Will Ferrell had done it the week before. It didn't work. And I think it lacked well, maybe, that. Maybe it did. Maybe well, she only got yeah, no, maybe maybe it helped her, but I my feeling is that, that that's a national kind of publicity stunt. And the power, it doesn't really have anything to do with the power. I mean, that plays great, probably. I mean, that plays great great with the progressive base that might donate to the Stacey Abrams campaign. But I don't know that that plays so great with people who are voting in Georgia. I can also add, uh, in terms of new techniques, uh, so I did the door knock. But um, the campaign is based on that. Recently, they've actually been sending out texts. Um, it's like maybe. Uh, very quick ones, you know, it's somebody from Mass Dems or, you know, whatever organization, and then, you know, like, they'll just ask you, are you voting or you support us, you know, just type Y or N, uh, try to, you know, make it convenient. Um, you know, I get, like, a text a week from some organization, obviously your numbers are um, in your registration, so that's how to get it, um, which I uh, see it as interesting because, um, you know, it is as convenience, or you don't have to necessarily have to pick up the phone. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, a lot of people would take a spam. Um, so for example, I used to have a, a filter that blocked out, you know, those text messages. I had to because I needed to test my bank, so finally they all started coming in. Uh, but uh, definitely, that's passing with uh, those quick texts are definitely uh, something I've seen. Yeah, and I think one thing that this dovetails with it, if you're concerned about privacy, on our fiber guy who works at Google over the weekend, and it turns out Cambridge Analytica, which was the group that Trump used in 2016 to do a lot of his micro targeting, is pioneering using voting rolls, public records, to kind of really dig deep into um, who people are voting for, where they're registered, and then using text and so forth. And he was saying, you know, again, as we know more and more about privacy, that, that all these companies can learn enough about you and your habits. They don't have to know how you vote, but they can judge pretty easily based on your zip code and your magazine subscriptions and things like that, who you're voting for. And that combined with texting or things like that may be a way in which, you know, we're, we're more micro-targeted um, in the future, which may create concerns. Um, Uh, yes. Um, when you first, the first thing you mentioned was that you started watching Fox and started getting me thinking about the news that people are watching, and especially you, sir, when you talked about um, how some of the Hispanic folks who were going to vote didn't have all the information that they that they needed to make that decision. Um, the problem is that we're all getting our information from the news. Um, so, uh, President Trump is. Obviously, not changing tack on the way he deals with the press, as was evident today. Um, I'm wondering if Democrats or Republicans um, are going to change tack and how they're using the press and perhaps setting up a um, you know a a white flag to prospective uh, news organizations to be sort of convincing people towards their side. Um, can I just uh, say, uh, for example, in East Boston, um, and, uh, for example, uh, you know, a lot of Spanish speaking voters uh, won't go to Fox News or an English TV channel. Obviously, it's, it's hard for them to comprehend it. So they will look at, you know, uh, Univision or Mundo, 
and yet they still cover like a state wide. They don't, they don't always close. Uh, at least what I noticed in Boston um, is that there are a lot of associations or well, but groups that um, get together um, people based on their nationality. Uh, so, for example, uh, in East Boston, uh, I can tell you about this person. Her name is Lauren uh, uh, Robles, not related to me, but uh, she is a you know a community leader and the host various events um, you know based off of uh, Latin American art and culture. And people will actually come to those events, you know, to celebrate their heritage, or you know, it doesn't have to be just any specific day. It's kind of like a community event. And then there, uh, that's when they talk about issues, you know, on ballot or uh, specific candidates. And so a lot of people, at least uh, I noticed that for Spanish voters in my community, I get a lot of info from these community leaders that assemble them. And then once you know for a different reason and once they're there inform them of you know some of the issues that are in the community on ballot. I, I guess I would just add that um, research of which our uh, matriculating students looked at um, and, and you can uh, cite the author in text but um, the research that was done several years ago that suggested that um, the uh, rise of ethnic populations would prima facie lead to fundamental change in the electorate um, proved to be off base uh, and wrong once we looked at the 2016 election for a variety of reasons. And one of those reasons is that uh, the flow of information within those communities and, and to those communities um, it is not necessarily being driven by Fox News, for example, or by MSNBC. Um, and, and part of what that suggests to me is that in the same way uh, that um, machine politics uh, in most cities emerged from neighborhood associations, and barbershops and um, uh, ethnic uh, groups and clubs and the like a century ago. Um, and that led to the election of, of certain kinds of candidates. We may need to look back at that kind of organizational model as a way of reaching populations which, if they are informed, will vote. Um, but to a large extent, they don't have the information that those of us in this room are used to looking at. Um, many of our students are either journalism students or political science students. They're deeply immersed in looking at a variety of media and making comparisons um, and, and then making decisions uh, based upon that. But as among the populations that are arriving and uh, beginning to grow, um, the communication systems are different. Um, and in many respects, I think more reflective of uh, the way communications took place a century ago in a lot of communities, and therefore door knocking works. Um, if it's done by people who are considered local and authentic, as opposed to being done by celebrities surrounded by uh, television. Yeah, I think one way that media and politics kind of connect is the collapse of local news sources and the concentration of whether it's our graduates or journalists in general in the big cities basically created this void, right? Nobody, nobody was writing about the opioid epidemic, the collapse of jobs in the Midwest. We kind of wrote that off. We all love to write about other issues, national issues, maybe inner city issues because we drove past them on our way to the global or on the way to Jobs, but the collapse of local newspapers meant that nobody was writing about those issues. And, and I think there's an argument to be made that Fox News and Breitbart and others filled that void. Like, here's an explanation that makes sense. Two things about sort of behind your question is will Trump still attack the media? I think it will because it works for him. Um, uh, Kevin O'Brien, who's in our class, was watching not Fox, but other right wing sites uh, yesterday. And one of the things he said, reported on, um, was that 
a lot of, I, I was saying I thought Fox was pretty good. And he was saying if you went to the right wing sides, they were criticizing Fox for not just giving them, you know, the pure Trump thing. You know, they want the vote. You know? And so I think that's going to be true. I also think that the truth is, it's not like anybody who voted yesterday didn't know what Donald Trump stands for. There, there wasn't a lack of information. Or what the Republicans did. You know, they won a lot of races. Bill and Wallace, they see it and lost. And I think that the Democratic or the obsession on the part of some Democrats to try to figure out either the unfairness or the collusion or it's all Fox's problem is a dangerous trap because it may be that just their argument is wrong. Either their candidates are not right or they, you know, there's a lot of criticism of federal war for being too far to the left. Um, Ted's point that what may be amazing about Gillum and Stacey Abrams is that they got to 48%. I, I think that, you know, the other thing that Trump will know is that in the exit polls, they ask, is America more divided? People said yes. Who's to blame? Trump was second, the media was first. So uh, I think Trump is going to keep on pounding on that. And, and again, I think, you know, I go back to what Marty Barron said about we just have to do our job. I, I think, you know, by getting the information out there, that's part of the battle. But then it's up to Democrats or others who oppose Trump or Republicans on their side to then carry the message. And I think it's the message that's that was really kind of is at stake. I'm not sure. I don't think you can lay this one. On the, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm being too defensive. Hi. So um, I just wanted to first say I want to the door knocker. We knocked for Iona Presley, and I'm under 30 years old, so door knocking works. And uh, my question is, um, what do you think of the potential for uh, Seth Moulton to run for president in 2020? Do you think he's a good candidate and to be killed? Run? Sure. I mean, Seth's been in Iowa, you know? He's, I think he's been up in New Hampshire, too. He's, he's, he's testing the water. Seth is a, a very... Um, you know, he also has a really compelling personal story. He's kind of one of those guys like if you had, you know, carved out of clay the ideal Democratic candidate for this age, who was also a Marine and a veteran and not and a, and a war hero who had, was quiet about his war heroism. Like he's got, you know, he's got the whole package and he he knows it. Um, and he has been, you know, fairly, you know, unafraid to, you know, to 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 not only push back against Trump and be really out there in the media, but also to push back against his own party. He's been one of the most vocal voices in opposition to Nancy Pelosi, um, which is which is a risky strategy for him, you know, with a, he's not gonna assume a whole lot of power in the house if she stays in, but it, it's it's not a bad thing for a national profile and for someone who understands the media, you know, the, the, he's easy to book and they'll book him and they'll say what, what you know, what they wanted to say. So um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he also tested the waters. Um, you know, he he's I guess a little bit more of like the middle of the road guy. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard for it's hard for me to place him at this moment in the in the kind of pantheon of people who are running and sort of where he is in relation to to the you know to the real kind of red meat progressives. So it'll be interesting to see how he positions himself. But yeah, I think he's ambitious. And he's, you know, he's an attractive yeah. I was wondering if any of you think that somebody's going to twist uh, Jamie Dimon's arm of J.D. Morgan Chase because he was saying, well, I'm really not interested. But then he said, well, I'm not like Trump. I didn't count money. I did it all on my own. So what do you think? Well, <laughs> As I said earlier, I think that there are some um, unpredictable out-of-the-box candidates who are likely to appear. I think the level of um, uh, lack of cohesiveness in terms of uh, either party's ability to deliver a candidate uh, in the way that, that parties have traditionally delivered candidates uh, who will uh, encourage a number of people um, to uh, think that they have both the national recognition um, and the ability to uh, uh, generate the financing necessary 
uh, to be able to run uh, a viable campaign. And um, that could include some philanthropists. Um, it, it could include uh, certainly people like uh, Seth Mohan, um, who has already uh, been tested uh, in, uh, in elections, uh, and other kinds of people. So, I, you know, I, I think it's premature for any of us to um, uh, be uh, touting particular candidates. On the other hand, six months from now, there will be a field. Um, and uh, that field is, is going to winnow itself out. And as was the case with both uh, Trump's election and Obama's election, uh, the front runners are not necessarily going to be the people who are going to get the nominations. Uh, so I think we're, we're in for kind of a wild ride over the next two years. One thing I would add, too, is that it's with one very notable and glaring exception, it's been traditionally very hard. It's, it's very attractive. It's an attractive proposition for very wealthy people from the private sector to say, oh, I'm successful and I, you know, I have a lot of money, so let me run. I mean, you know, um, Meg Whitman and Carly Fiorina and, you know, like, oh, I read, you know, obviously Donald Trump is an exception to that. But Donald Trump is, is he is a media creature. And he was, you know, even at the time that he was a real estate magnate, he was a New York media creature who found a way onto television and became a national media creature. There is a, there, there, there is a skill that he has in terms of messaging and packaging and understanding how to appeal to an audience that is honestly, that, that, that outpaces anyone on the political arena on any side right now, and certainly anyone who's going to come from Wall Street or the private sector. It's not easy to do. Yeah, and I guess the other thing I'd add is that um, uh, the very nature of Congress, with as many women in it, um, will, will um, change the dynamic of the dialogue that goes on over the next year. I mean, 90 to 100 women will not debate issues uh, as part of, of uh, the congressional dialogue in the same way that we've seen uh, men debate some of the same issues. Uh, my expectation, maybe it's just the hope, is that there's going to be a much higher level of civility, even as people may disagree with each other. That's going to be one change. But the other change, I think, is going to relate to um, the, the, the building of new kinds of coalitions. Um, the defeat uh, of Scott Walker, who worked so hard to uh, eliminate uh, public sector um, uh, unions in Wisconsin, means something. Uh, his defunding, as was the case in uh, Kansas and Arizona, of uh, education, um, and the fact that folks who took that course are now seeing a backlash against that kind of defunding of certain types of of uh, valued social services. That means something. Um, we focused a lot of discussion around the role of um, suburban white women. But what we're really talking about is not a demographic. We're talking about uh, a commitment to a set of values, uh, education and health care and how we raise our kids and, and those kinds of issues. It's not women per se. It's those people who have articulated values um, that, that need to be coalesced in ways that we may not have uh, coalesced those values over the last X number of years. And so the question is, who has the will and the capability to develop new sets of coalitions that prepare for an electorate in 2020 that's going to be looking for movement forward on some level? And some of that movement forward may be related to infrastructure related to improving transit because everyone is really sick of sitting in traffic. Maybe it's it's the way we think about logistics in a city um, driven by autonomous vehicles um, uh, and, and um, Lyft and Uber as drivers of a kind of dialogue that will be different uh, than the dialogue that we've seen up to now. 
Well, interestingly, that, that was Ayanna Presley's argument when she ran in the primary. She really did it. I thought she did an excellent job of making this kind of nuanced case for, you know, the, the, the big deal about that primary is that she was running against a very progressive candidate who was, you know, a longtime congressman who had voted, you know, they, they would have voted essentially the same on every vote that would have come up before them. And so a lot of people came to her and said, well, why are you even running? You know, what, what are you doing here? Her argument was... The lived experience that I have had, my experiences as a woman, as a person of color, as someone who grew up in the inner city, as a victim of violence, as someone whose father was incarcerated, as a mother, or as a stepmother, as a wife, my experiences drive my priorities, and they drive the issues that I will bring to the fore. And I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about, right? It's that the, the more diversity of experience you have in Congress, it's not about checking boxes and not about just sort of saying vote for me because I am a woman. The more diversity of experiences you have, the more perspective you have into the mix, the more different priorities you're going to see coming. If you have everybody in Congress looking pretty much alike, and they all drive to work the same way and get to work the same way, they might not even see that this person can't get to work and needs a different transportation system. And one thing I would point out is Republicans often do well as polarizing candidates, right? Nixon did very well that way. Um, even though Reagan had a genial personality, that was a very polarizing election. And certainly that's true with Trump. Democrats tend to do well when they move to the Senate. Right? That's what Jimmy Carter did, that's what Clinton did, that's what Barack Obama did. And people, I think, forget you know, Barack Obama was a moderate in that way. So he really positioned himself that way. So that's, I think, also a challenge for the Democrats is can they get somebody who can be seen as moving to the center. And that's why you kind of wonder, you know, the Democrats always face these moments, like when Bill Clinton has his sister soldier moment where he announces, you know, sister soldier rap music. And, and, you know, do the Democrats have to tackle some third rail issue like immigration um, or trade in a way that will bring back uh, some of those white working class voters that they need to, they need to get. I mean, the division, those numbers, as much as demographics have changed, it's clear that Democrats cannot keep losing white working class men and women at the rates they're doing and still and still win. Um, I would also say to the Jamie Dimon question, you know, we all love that kind of, what is this, Jamie Dimon and Oprah, you know, it's, it's, it's great. You know, and I think Joanne is right, there's a certain reality check. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be looking at 2016 and saying, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, like if we could have just won one of them. And I think that's going to concentrate everyone's minds and why suddenly people like, you know, Hickenlooper or Sherry Brown or people who are low on the charisma scale, um, but somehow I mean, Biden obviously is another one, you know, trying to figure out how do you put them on the ticket in a way that, you know, we can just get those states. Yeah, I, uh, I think one result from the last two presidents, uh, presidents, President Obama, President Trump is the traditional resume that you need to become president has been thrown out the door. Barack Obama went from state senator to president in less than four years. Donald Trump doesn't have any political experience whatsoever. And I think this has encouraged a lot of people uh, to think about the presidency who might not have otherwise. Seth Moulton being one of them. Um, certainly he's got the military background, two-term, excuse me, three-term congressman. But I see other folks out there. Um, I came across a news site in Iowa Brendan Boyle is walking around in Iowa. Does anybody know who Brendan Boyle is? He's a popular congressman from Philadelphia. Nobody outside Philadelphia has heard of him. I'm kind of curious. We hear a lot about the Boston Globe and, and New England. Seth Moulton, Elizabeth Warren, Deval Patrick, even Warren Healy. Are these people just being tossed around in the New England, Massachusetts bubble, or do they have a legitimate chance to, to throw their hat in the ring and, and actually people know who they are outside of New England? I mean, I think, and Ted, you said this earlier too. Like everyone has sort of an equal, an equal chance at this at this point in time. Um, you know, anything can happen, and I think the field, um, the, the field is going to be fairly massive. And, and how to winnow that down is going to be one of the Democrats' challenges. Um, I mean, yeah, we're we're in New England, so we, you know, there's, there's that kind of hometown thing where you, you know, you focus on on your local candidates, and I think. I think it's actually possible that, that Seth Moulton gets a little more attention because of that 
than he does outside of here. I'm not, I'm not sure how much of a household name he is. I'm not sure how much of a household name Deval Patrick is. I mean, you know, do you know who the governor of Oregon is? Quick, like, like you know, it, it's we do we do tend to to sort of think of our own people. Elizabeth Warren is a different animal. She really very very swiftly made a national name for herself. I mean, it's really impressive how how quickly she became a national figure, and I think it's because um, she's she has a certain energy level and an ability to articulate things in this passionate way. That, that goes, you know, it, it's a skill that's really above and beyond the skill of, of many of the other, uh, you know, many of the other senators, honestly. It's, like a, it's a fairly milk-toast bunch, a lot of them, and she's this passionate person. It's interesting because she came straight out of academia. I mean, I think, I think being a passionate law professor, but also having a specific set of issues that she really, you know, fully believed in and authentically cared about, and sort of carried through. I mean, you remember the reason that she ran for Senate in the first place is because she was supposed to be head of the Consumer Protection Bureau, and that was blocked by uh, Mitch McConnell, right? I mean, you know, it was like it, the, the, she she was sort of had a path to being a bureaucrat in D.C., you know, shepherding an issue that she cared about. It got blocked in a partisan way, and she was like, okay, I guess I will run for Senate. And and she did. Um, so. I think that the takeaway from that is that whoever prevails is going to have to have a certain set of talents and skills. It's not about your resume so much as it's about your ability to convey a message. What do you think, if you're the ages, um, the old guys, the, the Bloomberg, Biden, Bernie? I've always uh, I've always been a great fan of, um, of Biden, even before he became uh, vice president. Um, and I think he'll be uh, a formidable candidate, uh, but he may be a front runner. Um, and I think that uh, several of the people you've probably all of the people that you've mentioned um, will be. Um, early, um, they'll be stalked by others, they will raise the right issues, um, they will articulate values, um, but I guess it, it's partly my hope that they will um, also inspire, uh, again, not uh, wanting to appear to be ageist, which, um, uh, they will, um, inspire and uh, break ground for um, a demographic of candidates who will be younger than they are. Um, and not so much because they're not good candidates or, or not likely to win, uh, but because it's uh, time for a passing of the baton to uh, a generation that uh, looks at a, a number of cultural issues differently. Um, communications issues, uh, family issues. I mean, if you just look at, at the demographics of a place like Boston, right, we tout the fact that our population is growing. That's great. But in fact, it's not uh, as large a population as we had in Boston in the 50s. Um, and, and in the 50s, there were 150,000 more people living in the city than is the case today. But they were living, living in different kinds of family units. And, and the culture of the city was different than what it is today. And uh, I think that um, in, in the same way that uh, Mayor Walsh has looked to an administration which is constituted of people who are part of this different culture, um, nationally we need to do that as well. I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, actual and potential voters who are more likely to be inspired um, by a, an individual who knows about Facebook and Twitter but doesn't misuse it, uh, and then uh, has a lot of experience. Yeah, then and then um, uh, by older individuals who are sort of picking up new cultural values as an afterthought. Um, just to add to that, um, you know, with, you know, with, um, for example, with Bogor, 
which is when he had a very strong and energetic campaign, even in his such a speech, you know, he said, I actually love you guys. Uh, but then, you know, compared to Bernie, he was way more older than and I still had that same energy of uh, ramping people up. Um, you know, I, in my opinion, I don't think it's necessarily your age, it's just the energy that you have. Um, you know, this, uh, for example, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton uh, definitely has a different sense of energy compared to Bernie. You know, you'll learn uh, that, that right off kind of gives you a different sense of energy. And then, you know, for other candidates, you can tell um, you could be the honorable, but it's just how you got the end. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I went to a, there was a Bernie Sanders rally in my town last time around, and I did this, went to check it out, and it was you know it it you could under you walked away from that understanding why there was a movement behind him. In this in in the same way, I did not attend the Trump rally, but I suspect that you would feel the same way. You would say, okay, this guy knows how to energize people, and you're right; those are two guys who are you know. Pushing 70 or over 70. So, yeah, it can be done. So, in an earlier session, you and I talked about, um, uh, I want to talk about polling, the effect on polling on the elections. I strongly believe that 2016 was about polling. The polls were so sure that Clinton would win that a lot of people either stayed home or raised their disappointment in her by throwing away their votes on third party. I think polling had a lot to do with 2016. So the question is, what do you think it had to do with this election? How do you think the polling worked in, in, in this election? Again, I think a lot of mistakes, I mean, there were a lot of races that were not nearly as close as what we thought they would be. Um, and, and I'm wondering, um, given what you also said, which I think is very, very true, that polling is failing largely because people aren't telling the truth um, or, or, or something. So the question is, how do you think it affected this election, and how should it affect? What should the media do about polling and, and the use of polls? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it, I mean, it was an interesting. I mean, I think one thing I saw, if you watched, you know, the coverage and bounced around and looked at everything from five thirty eight to the Times to CNN and, and kind of, I think everybody was more cautious this time. I think everybody felt burned, and it was interesting to me. Fox called. Fox called the House for the Democrats an hour before everybody else, which I think was kind of surprising. And CNN, despite the frenetic activity, kind of didn't want to call anything, I think, because they felt burned. I think Nate Silver at 538 is very defensive about this, and, and his line is basically, well, we were right overall. But you want to say, yeah, Nate, but you were wrong about like, every good race. And I think that's, that's where I think the, the uh, Scrutiny is going to come. You know, Florida, Georgia, Donnelly, over and over again, they were wrong about that. I mean, there's sort of two questions. One is clearly, whatever polling is done, where we continue to miss things, whether it's the Ayanna Presley surge in the congressional race, whether it's perhaps in the Gillen race in Florida, the Tom Bradley effect of African American candidates, kind of people lying about that. Um, but it happened on both sides, right? Beto was closer, Donald D was worse. I mean, there's not kind of a systemic bias. It, it does feel, and again, I, I come back to Trump over and over again, Trump seems to hit a certain emotional button, which not only Democrats have a hard time with, but like pollsters have a hard time with. There, there's something about whether people are not being honest or, or the samples are wrong. I mean, that's the, the big takeaway from 2016 was that the reason the polling was so wrong is that they underestimated white working class turnout. So there was like a, a statistical reason for it. Um, in terms of, of what impact it should have, you know, it's like catnip, right? It's like pornography. You can't not, you know, everyone wants to know what's going on. And so I remember at one point Shira Center, who was here, um, uh, early on, the political letter of the Globe said to me at one point, she thought the Globe was going to cut back on its polling, in part because of all the problems. I'm not sure if it did that or not. Um, I think it's still a useful tool. 
Um, I don't know how people felt. It seemed to me that everybody was bending over backwards to remind people the polls could be enacted. So at least there was that. But, but I don't know what's your... I, mean, I think in, in terms of what the media can do, the, the challenge for the media in covering races is that there are a couple of traditional markers that the media has long used to judge a candidate's viability. And one is polls, as a, you know, what's an objective measure that you can find for how people are thinking about a race. And one is money, you know, how, how much how, how much money a candidate is able to raise is, is kind of a proxy for how much support and, of course, how, you know, how much ability that candidate is going to be able to have to, you know, to, to wage a, a viable and, and kind of energetic campaign. The problem is that those can be inaccurate markers. They miss an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez completely, right? I mean, it, that was a grassroots effort that required very little money in Queens, and she really did do the door-door knocking, and she drew out, like Ayanna Presley did, she drew out populations that weren't, you know, the, the other challenge with polls is that often, often pollsters use likely voters as a sample, and what they do is they go back historically, how many elections have you voted in? Well, that works unless you as a candidate are able to draw new people out to this election who haven't voted before, and so they're not going to get captured in the poll. So in a race, you know, in, in races like the ones we just saw where turnout was such a huge factor, where the ability to draw out your base and to bring in new supporters is going to have a, a huge effect on, on your performance, polls are often going to fall short. So the, me, so, so the question for the media is, okay, if you have to take polls with a real grain of salt, if you even have to take money with a real grain of salt, how do you judge? You know, the answer is the very, you know, it's, it's a labor-intensive shoe leather reporting answer. You go and you follow the candidate around, you try to get a vibe and you get a feel and you, you know, you, you, you get that subjective sense that you can add to your objective measures and go back to an earlier point, but the less local reporting there is, the less opportunity there is to get that sense. Yeah, I have the time to is that the Times had a really interesting story, which I thought was ended up being pretty smart, which was everybody was writing Democratic women in the suburbs. And the Times had a story pretty late, about two or three days before the election, talking about women, white women who like Trump. And it was very and it was, yeah, it was very anecdotal. It was like your classic, I went there and I talked to people and I think these people are interested. And journalists always get criticized for that, right? We talk to three taxi drivers, go to a bar, and we think we understand something. But maybe we need to go to more bars. And Barber shops. Barber shops are my favorite. So, so I think there may be some combination. And, and maybe the way to deal with it, as Joanna says, is to say there's polls, but there's also these other measures. One of the things that conservatives are pointing out is in this cycle, the Democrats had the money, they had the polls, they had Oprah, you know, and they still didn't do as well as they thought. So I think the media has got to make some judgments about who they listen to and, and how they highlight. Um, it was interesting to me, and again, it's just a focus group sample, it's small, but in our class of what, 22 students, I asked them, so when I taught uh, this course, or version of this course in 2016, and I said, what's your favorite website? 538. People love 538. They were checking it all the time. And I asked people who followed 538, two or three people. A lot of people felt burned by 538. And instead, they were watching CNN or reading the Times or the Post. So consumers may also be adjusting their expectations and not so slavishly following, following the polls. Uh, yes, uh, I have a one question uh, that may go beyond and above your pay grade, um, but since this is a community discussion, I felt it would be appropriate to ask it uh, within the community. Uh, and those probably one of the most interesting articles I read during the midterms was one from the New York Times, written by uh, Michelle Goldberg, called We Can Replace Them. And whilst the, it, uh, I'm just a quick quote, uh, right now America is tearing itself apart as an embittered white conservative minority clings to power, terrified at being swamped by a new multiracial polyglot. Um, so looking at the races in um, Georgia, in Florida, in Texas, 
you have these essentially California liberals able to run in these pretty uh, conservative states, Texas and Georgia certainly, um, and they, you know, Stacey Abrams ran uh, pretty anti-gun. She talked about um, confiscating rifles from people that you wouldn't think possible four years ago, um, two years ago, um, certainly not 20 years ago, literally impossible. Um, and there's a phrase that's very popular, Bill Crystal said it last night, looking at the races, that demography is destiny, i.e. people uh, in a variety of reasons feel an ethnic loyalty, and this applies to all groups. And if you have enough, a, like she says, a polyglot coalition, a multiracial coalition against the conservative whites, you can win. And you can win on policies with policies that wouldn't be thought possible. So my question is, um, and a lot of this would be, it's very new to America. I mean, prior, we actually had immigration laws prior to 1965 that were designed to protect a, a European majority. Um, the, and it was changed by the Democrats in 1965. So everything that's happening is very new and unprecedented. Um, so my question is, uh, is this politics of racial coalition building and replacing the po – rather than I – mean, because the conservatives in Georgia weren't – didn't all of a sudden see the light of gun control, right? There was just different people there. Right, so you put together a coalition. Yeah, yeah. It's, so my, my – and uh, David Brooks from the New York Times asked this last night. Which I thought was, you know, this is a question people are starting to ask is uh, on his Twitter, over the next few decades, America will become a majority minority country. It, it is hard to think of other major nations down through history that have managed such a transition and still held together. So my question is, is this sort of politics uh, sustainable long term? Good. You want to? <laughs> and landmark theory of local incrementalism? Not that I'm being profiled or anything. <laughs> um, cities like uh, New York and San Francisco, uh, which are uh, polyglot cities, um, have managed to hold together electing. Um, a range of individuals uh, of different ethnicities and genders um, for at least 40 years. Um, and, um, you know, I believe you talk about Tom Bradley. Tom Bradley, as, as an African American, was elected mayor of uh, Los Angeles back in the 60s. Um, uh, there uh, have been people of color elected uh, in, uh, as far as I've been able to identify, who've been elected mayor um, in uh, virtually every major American city with the exception of Austin. So um, the fact of the matter is that polyglot cities or political entities um, don't fall apart because they're diverse. Um, and the fact of the matter is that um, whatever David Brooks has said, and I, I saw that piece, um, there are countries that are diverse countries uh, that don't implode and don't self-destruct and have in fact um, existed for extended periods. Um, the, the issue from my perspective is not one of uh, race or gender. Uh, the issue is, is an issue of how America deals with economic class um, and the sense that whether one is a person of color um, or white, um, and that uh, across the country there's a sense that opportunities to move up the economic and social ladder have been foreclosed, whether you are um, a, a white worker descended from coal miners in West Virginia, um, or um, an African American who lives in an inner city in, in Detroit. Um, class distinctions and uh, economic inequality 
um, from my perspective, drives decision making in an electoral sense more compellingly than almost any other factor. Um, and to a large extent, we not only fail to talk about that uh, as an issue, um, but uh, individuals and parties have yet to develop uh, cohesive strategic plans um, that, that address that issue. Uh, even here in Boston, for example, we, we talk a lot about gentrification and how people are driven out of the city by rising rents. And yet we've done very little analysis of where those people go. And very often those people are um, uh, gathering again, but in different communities, uh, in different physical locations, and maintaining the cohesiveness and diversity of their communities. And, and we ought to be learning from that. Why do they choose those communities? And how do they stay together despite the fact of, you know, Robert Putnam's bowling alone theory? Why do communities come together? Why do so many people come to this class every Wednesday night from uh, throughout this region? Um, it's intellectually stimulating, of course, um, but it's also the case that there's a certain cohesion. And so um, there will be demographic change. There's already been demographic change. Um, and um, whether you look at the studies that have been done of uh, corporations that diversify and then see their profit margins go up, um, or um, uh, schools that diversify, we'll be dealing with that next week, and find themselves producing more leaders in a wide range of fields. Uh, it, it's not the diversity per se uh, that tears people apart. What tears people apart is the sense that they can't move forward together in a way where everyone ends up better off. And uh, that's the issue that it seems to me the parties have to address. Um, final thought from Joy. Oh, um, hard to top that, but I would I would add, um, not to shamelessly plug my own thing, but here I am, that you know, I I spent the last couple of months immersed in in you know immigration law over the past century and a half. And the definition of polyglot has changed, and the definition of who's the new minority has changed. And with every generation, every wave of immigration that came from Europe, from Africa, from South America, from Central America, from Asia, there has been a backlash, a response of you know people, uh, you know, of, of sometimes it's sort of it's physical violence. Oftentimes it's laws, new laws that are enacted to address. You know, the, um, perceived threats in in the eighteen in the, in the in the second half of the nineteenth century, there were laws that prevented Chinese women from Chinese women who were prostitutes from entering the United States, and it was applied like pretty blanketly to all Chinese women because there was there was fear of an influx of that population. There's, there's always a new population coming, and there's always a backlash. And then there's, you know, a, a community building. There's assimilation, and a, a, you know, a new generation of, of Americans kind of comes up, and then a new generation enters. So it's kind of the same old story. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great panel, and we'll begin with.